our first speaker is Gwen Awarda. Gwen is the executive director of Tulip Time, a position she's held since March 2011. She's responsible for planning and executing this nationally recognized festival celebrating tulips, Dutch heritage, and community. Tulip Time has been recognized as one of the top 100 events in North America by the American Bus Association for the past 27 years. Over half a million visitors attend every year, resulting in an economic impact to West Michigan of $12.9 million every year. Prior to joining Tulip Time, Gwen had a long career in human resources at Johnson Controls and Prince Corporation. Gwen has been actively involved in the Holland community for a number of years, serving with the Ready for School Initiative, the Lakeshore Nonprofit Alliance, and the West Coast Leadership Program. She also has served on the Holland Chamber Board of Directors, and Gwen is a Hope College graduate. Not only that, Gwen is a fine photographer. I discovered this book at the tourist office and there's two beautiful pictures of tulips in there that Gwen did. So I will put the book over there and um, after class you can check out some of the books that are there. Next week we'll have a bibliography for you of books about Holland from local authors. <coughs> so Gwen, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here today and on this snow covered day to talk about tulips. We do need the snow, however. I'm not a fan of winter. I don't some days. I ask myself why I live here. But we need the snow and we need the cold to keep these little beauties sleeping so that they will bloom on time in May. We cannot have another 2012 stem fest. You know, I was happy because 2012 was the first year that I had this position. Um, and it was a stem fest year and they, they didn't fire me, so <laughs> I still live here. So we obviously can't control the weather, so um, it's, it's good though. It's good to be here and to share a little bit about tulip time with you. I, I want to start by talking about the economic impact study. We as a staff and board have been talking about what is the impact of the festival, um, both economically and who comes and demographic information. And all the information we had was really old in the office. We've been saying around a $10 million economic impact, but we really didn't know, and I couldn't find that number in any study. So we said we need a study. So we contracted with Anderson Economic Group. They are a company out of Lansing, and they also do an economic impact study on art prize every other year. So they're very familiar with West Michigan, with festivals, how to capture how many people are here when you don't have ticketed events because they're free. And that's very similar, our prize and tulip time. So we were excited to work with them. They're, they were delightful and we uh, had a great week survey. We needed to find about 10 surveyors to work for two to three hours every day of the week because we wanted to go to multiple places in town and capture multiple groups of people that were here. So, our board were the first ones to raise their hand and say, we'll do it. And they did. They did all the survey, which was really wonderful for them to get out and see who's here as well. So let's talk a little bit about how people engage with Tool of Time. We know this, half of this information is our information, and half of it is from the economic impact study. But we have, on average, and especially last year, 529,000 individual unique visits to our web page. Amazing, the internet can calculate all that for you. 51% of those attendees use the website to plan their trip. We said, how do you know about us? How do you figure out where you are coming, what you want to do when you get here? 32% of those look for information on their smartphone and their tablet, and 29% of the folks use the brochure. And we print about 120,000 brochures we mail those out, but a lot of them are given out to visitors when they come. Can't tell you how many people show up at our door and say, I'm here, what do I do? Where are the tulips? You know, they show up to our office expecting to find rows and rows of tulips, and it's our operational office, but 
um, it's just interesting that some people don't do any research before they come and they do seriously call in the morning and say it's sunny where I am is it sunny there because we're gonna come and they do we're estimating 500,000 people descend upon Holland over an eight-day time period 310 of those folks buy a ticket to something so that's real actual data that we have through our system. So they're buying a seat um, on a trolley, they're buying a, a seat to go, sit and watch pray, they're going to a show, they're buying a meal. Many of you are from the churches that provide meals. So those are people we can quantify and say you're here. The other about 190,000 people are an estimate based on occupancy in hotels and, and who we think are here. We go on the parade route, you can't count how many people are here. And so it, do, it does become an estimate in some ways. So who's coming? What's the age of those folks? This demographic has begun to change over the years. 69% of the attendees are pre-retirement age. I think 20 some years ago, we would have said 69% of the people are post-retirement age. That still is a market that we clearly have, and I'll show you a little uh, more data on that in a minute. But interesting we've intentionally since I took this job in 2011 have been working on attracting the younger demographic as well we need that to be sustainable so this data tells us that we're doing a lot of things right and we need to continue on that path <coughs> the average income is $78,000 and 81% of the individuals have post high school education most have college or post college so we're dealing with, dealing with, in a positive way, a group of people who have disposable income to spend. They have an educational background. They're interested in history, and they're interested in Dutch culture. 56% were here for the first time, but 66% said, I'm coming back, either to another festival or to Holland at another time of year. And that just speaks to this community and what it's like beyond the festival. So what do people like to do when they're here? Lots of great things. Dutch dance was number one, parades, art and craft fair, fireworks, kinder plots, trolley tours, ticketed events and shows. Is there anything in this list that strikes you? Free. <laughs> right, good Dutch deal, we all like that, it's free. But every one of those first three items all have a budget impact to tulip time. They don't come free. So when you look on the, uh, the your right side of this slide, we may have to make up that budget money on our ticketed events as well. There's obviously expenses with ticketed events. So it's really an interesting proposition when you are offering a lot of great things in the community that are free. They don't come free when you pull on the expenses. So what, where do people come from? They come from all 50 states. And yes, this year, we had a group from Hawaii. It was a motor coach group. They had over 20 people. They flew in Detroit, into Detroit, boarded a motor coach, and drove to Holland for four days. Flew, or drove back to Detroit and flew home. Like, if you're gonna come here, why would you stay for four days? But there's a woman out there who's been here multiple times who puts this together and she just loves it and she finds people that want to come. So yes, we can say we have all 50 states. We don't track our international visitors in our office because we only have ticket data. We find that a lot of the international folks that are in town, um, they do go on the trolleys. You all see them, but we're not asking them for email addresses and that type of information to be able to track where they're from. And we know they're out at Windmill Island, and we know they come because they love flowers. I've made a couple really interesting connections this year with some of our Indian population and our local businesses to say, why, do you, why does everyone like tulips? Why do you come? Why do you invite your friends and family? One really interesting woman I've talked to at Johnson Controls said to me, we love flowers. And my parents come and visit us from India. She's lived here for 15 years. They come from India every two years, and we plan their trip around tulip time. 
they live here in Holland, and she said, we just love learning about Dutch culture and the tulips and everything that's provided. So she goes, that's when they come. So it's been fascinating for us to begin to learn a little bit about all the different cultures that do come and, and participate in many of the things we do. The ticket type, you look at that circle, we talked about a minute ago about the pre-retirement, post-retirement age. The majority of the post-retirement age come to Tulip Time by a motor coach bus. So 47% of our sales come from that motor coach industry. 53% of the sales come from general public, people who come from all over the United States and our local population. When we think about our funding, so on the funding side of things, we have about a $1.4 million budget, both income and expenses. We're basically a break-even nonprofit. We're excited and high-five each other if we make $10,000 at the end of the year. We're very break-even because of how we do things in terms of the free events that we do. Yet, we give back on the low side, $89,000, back to all the organizations that help us. So I look at HASP, you help us with the trolley tour guides. I look at the churches that provide the Dutch lunch. That, you know, those dollars are in there. The ticket sales that we share with organizations such as Laub, um, Pound Corral, the organizations that provide entertainment, we share those ticket sales with them. So we don't take all of that. We give back around $90,000 back into all those organizations. And for some of them, they look at me and go, this is one of our largest fundraisers this year, that we do in a year, is provide entertainment during the festival. If you're a sponsor, about 30% of our income budget comes from corporations who sponsor things. Every $1 that they give turns into $9.20 of broader economic impact into the community with a $12.9 economic impact to the community. A few people have looked at me and said, you make $12.9? said, I wish, because then I'd buy new bleachers. <laughs> but this is the, in the income that comes into the community in the form of hotels and restaurants and shopping and all the attractions. And some of our spending is in that number as well. But that's a fabulous number. We were thrilled to have it be greater than 10, which was the number we've been thinking. Ryan Cotton, the city manager, looked at this number and he said, I think it's low. Because I think you, you, we know we didn't track in this number outside of the Holland area in terms of hotels. We know many people don't stay in Holland. They'll stay in Granville. They'll stay in Saugatuck. We didn't track the income from all the attractions in that number. So I do agree with them. It's likely low, but hard to say, again, what it is. So 2016, what's happening? We have Bill Engvall coming back. Remember last year we had him scheduled, and then he realized his only son was graduating from college, and he couldn't come? Well, his wife tells me I'm really good authority that they have no more children graduating. <laughs> so he will be here. We're excited to have him out at Central Wesleyan. Four pianos. I don't know if ever, if any of you have ever seen or um, been to one of Walt Motsky's four piano shows. It's phenomenal. Charles Ashbrenner, who's one of the pianists, uh, a pianist instructor here at Hope, he plays in this group. Um, Janine Bird, many of you know her. Uh, Katha Petrulia plays, and then I can't think of the other gentleman. But he arranges music you will know and have all four pianos playing simultaneously on the stage. It's a really a phenomenal show. It is almost sold out. So if you're at all interested in those tickets, I would jump on that. The Wonder Bread Years. How many of you remember Seinfeld? A lot of you remember Seinfeld. This is a one-man comedy show talking about what it's like to grow up in the 70s. You get up on Christmas morning and Grandma comes down with a robe and her rollers and in her hair, and it's just hysterical. I think that will be a great show, and that's at Central Wesleyan also. New Odyssey, a fan favorite. They've been here every year since I've been here. Three men playing 30 instruments at a dinner show at the Hayward Inn. Again, an excellent show. The Art and Culture, um, Fifth Third Global Art and Culture pieces, um, Marvelous Wonderettes is a great play that will be at Holland High School. Needles Forever is going to be a show from the Windmill Chorus. I always want to call them the Barbershop. They've changed their name to the Windmill Chorus. 
A Song in My Heart by Richard Rogers is Holly Corral. That show this year will be at the new Jack Miller Auditorium. And we're really excited to get into that facility. It's not open yet. I've had the privilege of being able to walk through it because we had to look at the seating layout. Um, but that show will be there as well as four pianos. Dazzle is our salute show from all the uh, local high schools who bring in their choral, orchestra, band, jazz band program at, at Central Wesleyan. Broadway's Best is from Evergreen Commons, and Leading Iowa is the play that the City Theater is doing. So we've got a really great lineup of, of opportunities this year. And like I said, a lot of these shows are beginning to get full, so if you're interested in getting tickets, do um, get online or come into our box office. We asked ourselves a few years ago, boy, we're a tulip festival. We don't do anything with tulips. We don't really buy one tulip. We do for some pots that the city plans for us. The city does all that work, which we are so thankful for. But how can we look at gardening and look at flowers and put together programming? Last year we had P. Allen Smith here, and he also was here for the full week and did some production work and put together a video and a show about Holland and Tulip Time that will begin to air on PBS stations locally in February. And I got to see a sneak preview of that this week, and it's really wonderful. And Elisa is in it, and they're grinding grain in the mill, and it, it turned out excellent. So once we know that schedule, I'll be sure to get that over to Tim and Alice so they can let you know when it will be aired and you can watch. This year we've got Rick Weist coming. He is the CEO of Flowerland, and he, his famous line, if you've ever heard him or seen him on TV or his radio shows, is, thank you very much. <laughs> He's funny, and he will, will be great. Uh, we have Jay Schwanke, who does fun with flowers. He does more about uh, arranging things, and both of those are on the Saturdays uh, before and, and the last Saturday of the festival. We have people like to experience and do things. So we're doing coloring with Carolyn. We're doing a painting class with Lisa Schulis, who's a local artist. You can learn how to make pig in the blankets up at OAISD in their kitchen. I'm trying to just do some different things. They're not as good, I will tell you, as what first mom is. <laughs> I've been there and eaten them. They're awesome. But we'll try to show people how to make them. Trolley tours. One change this year is we are moving the booth location to Window on the Waterfront. If you hadn't heard, Centennial Park is terribly congested. Parking is difficult. So we're going to go over to Window on the Waterfront at 6th Street and Central College. Kara's whispering to me in the back, in college. So it, right when that dead ends, there's a window on the waterfront sign. There's power there. We're going to have an information booth, a trolley booth, and hopefully a food booth. So when people are waiting to get on the trolley, they can go walk through window on the waterfront. I'm working on some parking options around the corner that we can direct people to. And we're looking for some dedicated parking for the trolley guys, because I know that's one of your biggest challenges is how do I get down here as well. Um, but we're excited about that change in that move. I've had people say, well, will people be able to find you? I said, yes, because they come to our office first, and we send them to the trolley, and they just want an address. Give me the address. And they put that in their GPS. So it doesn't matter what location it's at. We don't think we can put it there. There will still be an information booth at Centennial Park, so they will direct people two blocks, three blocks down to be able to get the trolley if for some reason people do show up there. We've also moved fireworks to the second Saturday. So we're gonna kind of close out the festival this year with fireworks instead of open it with fireworks. Part of why we're doing that is because we're gonna try one more time to clomp the record. We have to beat Pella, Iowa, and the number of people dancing simultaneously in wooden shoes. So this is a fundraiser with Bethany Christian Services and their post-adoption service program. And we need 2,700 people to dance. It's not the regular dance. It's a five minute dance that repeats itself six times. It's very easy. Clap. You all know this. Clap, clap, left, right, clap, right? So you can help us. I know you can all show up. And dance with us before the fireworks and help us break that record. You'll see in the middle it says new Dutch dance music and a new sound system. Do I hear a yay? Yeah. <laughs> so, friend of a friend, I have one minute left. 
Holy cow. <laughs> friend of a friend connected me with Dr. John Berhewell. He played part of the original music. He has a recording studio in his home. He lives in Virginia. He has re-recorded the music. Awesome. So it look, sounds great. So we'll have that. We also are doing a new sound system. We still need to do some fundraising for that. The sound system is owned by Tulip Time. Most people didn't know that. They think the city owns it. So the city has agreed to help pay for it with us and to help us do some fundraising. We can get a dollar for dollar match through the state to put that new sound system in. It costs $100,000 to do three blocks of 8th Street and Centennial Park. So we'll send you some information. <laughs> because we need help. I mean, every $10 will help, trust me. So that's the end of my presentation, and I will open it up for questions. What's at the Knickerbocker? Unfortunately, nothing is at the Knickerbocker this year because we're using the Jack Miller. And a few of our other shows uh, we put out at Central Wesleyan because we need 1,000 seats, and the Knickerbocker only holds 500. So I'm disappointed we've been unable to find something that goes well in there. And when the uh, fiddle fire is at Beachwood Church. Yeah. It's a game, it's a tough game when you're buying entertainment. The cost of entertainment is really going up. <coughs> so we have to be in a larger facility to be able to pay for the, the tickets. I have a question. Uh, are locals still hosting tourists as they used to or not? In their homes? Yes. Um, no. No, we do not do that because we have so many hotel rooms, and especially now with the new Double Tree being open across the street. So, no, we aren't doing home, home tours. Marriott. Oh, sorry, not the Marriott. It's not the Double Tree. That's out on Waverly and 31. Other questions? Yes. Will there be restrooms available at Window on the Waterfront? Will there be restrooms available at Window on the Waterfront? Yes, we will have to put in porta potties because there isn't anything built there, but there will be porta potties there. That's a whole other part of the festival we really don't talk a lot about. So all that behind the scenes stuff, porta potties, trash. That's that's not the fun stuff to talk about, but the things we spend time on. You've talked about uh, a variety of things that are going into your studies. Have you ever studied how many hours are put into um, to put two look time together? That is a great question. I have no idea. I can tell you the hours our staff works. I can tell you many of the volunteer hours when they come and work a shift, but I can't begin to tell you the number of hours that the tour guides put in, both in prep, um, how long it takes to make all the food, so, no, I, that'd be a great thing to study. It'd be a lot. <laughs> One question back here, and then we'll come up to the front. Okay. Is any record kept of complaints that people make? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do have some of those. I can tell you last year, I didn't have one. The year before I had a couple. Typically the complaints we get are around um, content and shows or words that might be spoken that someone felt was inappropriate. But usually we don't get a lot of complaints. Gwen, do you have an estimate of how many volunteers you need from this community to pull this off? Depends on how you count those volunteers. Every Dutch dancer is a volunteer, yeah. so there's a thousand right there. We we say between 800 and 8,000, depending on how you track it, right? So if you count Dutch dance, if you count all the information booths, if you count all the people that are helping with food, and you those are volunteers we don't coordinate because we just work with Dorothy. We call Dorothy and say, Dorothy, find all the people to do this, and she does, which is fabulous. But um, we do, we find about 800 volunteers through our system uh, to pick up trash, to host shows, and do all those things. So 800 plus the Dutch dance, and then plus everyone else that volunteers their time. I have a question, Gwen. 
Last year, um, we really noticed that the number of Dutch gansers seemed to be down quite a lot. Has anything been happening to get that turned around, or is it no longer cool to be a Dutch dancer? There were there were many places there were huge gaps, yeah. you know, and it was really disappointing after you've seen it so right, full. Right, have seen it so full. We have been really consistent with around 800 Dutch dancers for the last three years. That includes the high school and the alumni group. The way Dutch dance works is there's 55 performances. So your team signs up for when they want to dance. Because you don't dance all 55. Most dancer dances anywhere from eight to 12 performances through the week. So I'm finding two things. The alumni have full-time jobs and can't get out of work. High school kids are in sports, dance, cheerleading, AP classes, and all the state AP exams are the week of the festival. Oh. I can't compete with that. I can't change it. And so it does become challenging. Um, I just talked to someone in this room whose daughter started um, Dutch dance this week, and I thought it might have even been this morning. And guess what time she had to be at school? 5.30, ready to practice. And part of it's because it's a club at the schools versus a sport, and they can't get gym time. The varsity sports get gym time before any of the clubs do. So they have to show up at 5.30 in the morning. Andy, I bet he dropped his daughter off this morning at 5.30. So that's another constraint. Kids are like, I'm not getting up to go at 5.30. <coughs> we have a costume closet that assists kids who can't afford the costume. Fabrics can run anywhere from one to two hundred dollars fabric alone. We do have a cap for what the seamstresses can charge, which is I think caps out at ninety-five dollars to sew a costume. I sew and I've sewn some of mine, but not all of them because they're complicated and they do take forever. And there's a ton of fabric in those skirts, so it's it's an expense that I think some kids can't take on. But we do have this costume closet for high school only that it helps to offset the cost of that. But that's a challenge. I don't know how to come at that differently. We've talked to the schools and they just go, well, it's a volunteer, it's a club. I don't know what to tell you. But we have had a consistent number. So part of it's just if people signed up or not based on their schedule. We're in time for one more and then I think Andy's on. So do you have any other questions? How many of you are trolley guides? Yay! Thank you! I will say thank you, thank you in advance of the festival because I don't know if I'll see you before. I appreciate what you do very, very much. You show our guests a fabulous time. They learn a lot about the community. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you do. I probably guided the second year I was here because every year I try to take something, a part of the festival that I've not done before, and do that so I can say I've learned been debating about learning Dutch dance, <laughs> but I couldn't fill in and dance 12 times during the festival, so it would be purely to learn it and say I know it, because I, ha I need about eight clones to get through the week as it is. So. Well, Gwen, thank you so thank much. You. That was a wonderful thing. Bachelor of Science in Parks and Recreation Administration from Eastern Kentucky University. He's worked for the City of Holland for 14 years in the Parks and Recreation Department. Andy has held the positions of, positions of Park Supervisor, Parks Supervisor, we have a lot of wonderful parks, don't we? Park and Cemetery Superintendent, and he is currently Director of Parks and Recreation. Andy and all of our speakers today have a lot to do with the fact that Holland is really a great place to live. Andy's parents, has members Sid and Sarah Kenyon, are here today, and I know they're very proud of Andy and Andy's family. Andy is always enthusiastic about 
We sent him to hands every time I sent him an email, which was many, many times, he, he came back with a very enthusiastic answer. And we've enjoyed his presentations before, and we're really looking forward to hearing from Andy today. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hopefully I have this mic right so you can hear me. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, thank you very much for having me. As Al said, my parents are in the house so the pressure's on. <laughs> make sure I get this, get this right. So, um, well, I've got a couple topics I want to talk about today. Um, I had to kind of whittle it down since I only have about 20 minutes to talk. Um, our whole department is called the Parks and Recreation Department, which includes parks, cemeteries, recreation, Limo Island Gardens, the Graph Nature Center and, and the Farmer's Market area. Um, so today, what I've brought it down to is specifically mostly parks, a little bit on cemeteries, and um, a project that we have done the last four or five years is Holland in Blue. Um, so with that, I'll get started. I've put together a few slides. Um, so who, who are we? Um, our parks and cemetery staff, um, we're made up of college students, volunteers, uh, retirees, um, we have 11 full-time staff that work for, for my department. Uh, it includes two recreation maintenance supervisors. And uh, we hire about 35 to 40 uh, part-time summer employees. Um, those make up most of the college students. We, uh, as a department, which I really like, um, we collaborate a lot with um, all city departments. Um, about the only department I think, and we were just having this conversation yesterday, is, is the assessing department. I don't speak with very much. But every other department, we have our fingers in some way. Um, we do everything from snow plowing, building maintenance, um, to tree work. And here's a picture of a slide of uh, some of our guys doing uh, tree work. Um, our forestry division is part of our park department. Uh, we take care of about 17,000 right-of-way trees. So that's the area between the sidewalk and the roadways and about 35,000 trees within the parks and other uh, city properties. Uh, we plant approximately 100 trees a year. Um, those 100 trees are ones that our staff does. Um, we also uh, trim about 2,000 trees a year. And rash borer. Um, many of you may know and probably do know, um, over the last few years, much of the Midwest and the eastern part of the United States has been affected by a little tiny beetle called the emerald ash borer. Well, it hit West Michigan a few years back and it devastated our ash tree population within the city. It's estimated that we took down about three to 4,000 ash trees within the last four to five years. Um, we're just getting to the tail end of that removal. Um, so that uh, planting number, the 100 trees per year, is on its way up. City Council a couple of years ago has earmarked much more funding for our uh, tree planting uh, projects. and. This year, we just actually put out for bid, about a month ago, $95,000 worth of tree planting to take place this spring. Uh, about two hours ago, I found out um, that I um, was granted a, a grant through the United States Forest Service for $100,000. Um, we applied earlier in the year and we found out the floor. So, yeah, so that's it's very exciting. Uh, so we'll get that project underway in the fall. So between the $95,000 dollars and the hundred thousand dollar grant we're going to be able to plant almost a thousand trees this upcoming year so that'll be great uh, we have a long way to go to, to get that back to where it needs to be um, as you know when we take down trees we have lots of logs lots of wood what do we do with that wood uh, a lot of it gets mulched up um, a lot of it gets uh, put into our forestry yard which is at third and pine if you've ever seen that across from the, from the, the james the young power plant uh, that little fenced in area that's kind of ugly to look at um, has our, uh, our, our tree debris. And so that's open to the public if you'd like to come in there to get wood, um, to burn at your homes, a cottage, or wherever. Um, but what we use it for is, on occasion, we'll get that milled. Um, we'll create boards. Uh, we've made conference room tables. My whole office, if you want to come visit, is at, uh, off 24th Street. You can see some of the woodworking that we did. We have a whole office that's made of maple and walnut, and it's all done by in-house staff, and uh, it's a great, great project to have. Cemetery Division. Uh, we have two cemeteries in the city of Holland, uh, one in Graska and one on, um, it's called Pilgrim Home Cemetery off of 16th Street. Um, we uh, maintain those and we treat those just like we do our parks. So they're pretty big cemeteries, especially for a municipality to run. Um, we're kind of unique in that way. Uh, we do about 295 burials a year, six days a week. Um, we'll run uh, 
sometimes between two all the way to four burials in a day. Um, the past two weeks have been kind of quiet, so my guys have enjoyed that. Um, we have a 495 unit indoor columbarium type mosque. Um, the city of Holland uh, is pretty traditional um, in that uh, cremation has not caught on to West Michigan much. Uh, but this is a location that if you choose that option uh, at end of, end of life decisions, that is a beautiful option. And of course, all of our Memorial Day activities that we do uh, throughout the city um, during Memorial Day. We help with the parade, we have a uh, special presentation at uh, Pilgrim Home. Our parks division. Uh, we have about 400 acres of parkland within the city. Um, we maintain lots of other public spaces, including the police department, the Pond House Museum, uh, Van Ralty Farm, Boulevards, you might not know, but all the road out in front of Meyer, um, down Washington Boulevard, 12th Street Boulevard, those areas that are in the middle of the road, we as a park department actually maintain. We plant the trees and mow the grass, take care of the irrigation, etc. Um, we do, like I said, do irrigation. We have 72 individual, this is just kind of number crunching, but 72 individual meters that we maintain, water meters. So that's a lot of systems to maintain in our department. Of course, we do the mowing, the fertilizing, and all of the landscaping. Our summer staff, uh, we asked our summer staff, that 35 to 40 person group, to mow, trim, paint, do all sorts of odds and ends work uh, throughout the city during, during their days. Um, they are mostly responsible for all the plantings that you see around town. Um, the tulips in the fall that we plant and the annuals that we replace them with uh, in the summer and spring. Um, we operate all kinds of equipment. Um, we will train a 19-year-old student, college student, to drive a $35,000 pickup truck, pull two $25,000 mowers on a $10,000 trailer behind them. Um, so that's what we ask these people to do. So we, um, we put the most responsible kids on, that, on those uh, <laughs> um, so under our 11 full-time staff that we have, uh, we actually plant about 100 to 112,000 annuals in the spring after tulip time. So anywhere you see a tulip, other than on public property or along our tulip lanes, we actually replace all those with annuals. All of those annuals are grown in our greenhouse. I'll show you a slide in a few minutes. Of all the beds within the city, that in the parks, we have about 39,000 square feet of beds. Um, our largest ones are at Window and the Waterfront, which Gwen mentioned earlier about the drop-off uh, trolley. You can stop there and take a look at our uh, beautiful big flower beds. And of course, tulip time. Uh, our staff spends a lot of effort and a lot of time um, on the festival, uh, leading up to the festival especially. Once the festival gets here, it's kind of like hold on because it's going to go no matter what. So the two weeks prior to the festival is our busiest time of the year. Uh, we plan for things, we deliver pots, we, we help facilitate some of the things that uh, go on during the festival. This year we, we, we ordered 403,000 bulbs. Um, that bid goes out sometime in July. They get delivered to us in late September um, from the Netherlands. And uh, we put them in the ground between that particular time all the way through uh, Thanksgiving. Our goal is always to get done at Thanksgiving. We've only missed that a couple times, and that's been due to uh, bad, bad weather, mostly snow. This is a picture of our um, walk-in cooler. So when those bulbs come over from the Netherlands, we have to have a place for them to go where it's climate and temperature controlled. And in this cooler, these crates hold all those 400,000 bulbs. There's probably about 600, 700 crates um, in the cooler, and uh, we organize them by type, variety, and uh, not really by color, but kind of by color. We know what they are. So each row is a different, a different type. So we've got uh, about 90 different varieties that we, that we order. So when you're looking, looking around town, uh, you can think about that. A couple pictures, slideshow um, of uh, Centennial Park's fountain in the middle. Um, that's getting ready to have a little bit of a facelift. That, that uh, fountain is really, really old. I looked for a date today, I couldn't find one. But it goes back to at least the 1920s. And it's made of tufa rock. Um, it's kind of like a lava rock type rock, and uh, we've got some repairs to do on it this spring before the festival. But this, you can see in the picture, if you can see it, you can see a little bit of color in there. We've uh, let it go to just ferns and moss the last couple of years, and this year we're going to replant it with some more colorful plants. This is the city's greenhouse. Um, the city's greenhouse is over 100 years old. Um, this is where we grow all of those plants. Uh, we've grown and expanded our plantings 
and we've outgrown the space. So you may be aware, and some of you may, may be well involved in this, but the Commons of Evergreen um, has agreed to purchase the greenhouse from the city in 2017. So this growing season, next growing season, and then the Evergreen Commons will take over operation and um, they will own that property. Um, so we are right now looking at options to build a grow house or build a show house. So we're looking at spaces that uh, would accommodate what we do. Here's a picture of um, some of the plants um, from a couple of years ago. Um, these ones happen to be, um, I think they're poinsettias. Um, no, they're not poinsettias. <laughs> Geranium. <laughs> yep. See, you don't ask the plant guy. It's <laughs> recreation degree, not plant degree. Um, so, but yeah, so these plants, um, we decided a few years ago, um, one of the reasons we need more space is that we used to grow plants just in plugs. And when they start in plugs, they start by seed, and then they go to plugs and they go to pots. So what we'd like to do is um, have them in four inch pots by the time they're done. So these are almost to that point. Um, as you know, with the tulip, um, we are kind of a unique situation and we have to grow our plants at a different rate than many other growers do around West Michigan. Uh, by Memorial Day, they are done with their plants and having all these crazy sales on trying to get rid of product. Well, that's when we are just beginning to get ours into the ground. Um, so our goal for our annuals is July 4th to have them in the ground. So we're pushed back a month. So that's another reason why we grow our own. It's a picture of window on the waterfront. That's a sculpture. A couple of our guys planting trees. So we, we will continue to plant um, in house our own trees just like they're doing here. Most of our trees are ball and burlap, two and a half inch to three inch caliber trees, and that's about as big as you can go without having to rent a spade. So, other things that we do, uh, we build bridges. Uh, this is at uh, the north end of Window on the Waterfront, this is on the far right hand picture. Um, just a couple of our guys rebuilding that boardwalk. And then this guy way back in here is Steve Zweig. He's, he's our park supervisor looking at, this is what the deck looked like before and then this is kind of after during. So that's a couple of tipped over trees. Um, we do a lot of storm damage cleanup. And occasionally we do prescribed burns within the city of Holland. Um, we work with the uh, Outdoor Discovery Center and the Makatawa Area Coordinating Council and to, to help uh, to uh, get rid of invasive species we do things like prescribed burns. This one happens to be a window on the water. I got a whole lot of pictures of window on the waterfront, but this is window on the waterfront again. Um, you may recall two years ago, we um, did some spraying in the Macatow Marsh to, to uh, try to control some Phragmites, and um, that was burned as well. And we're gonna burn that again this spring. So when that comes out, that's a pretty neat thing to watch in, in a controlled setting. Special events, um, Labor Day Boardwalk. A couple pictures of that um, as a fundraiser for our South Perez Scholarship Fund to uh, allow kids that can't afford to participate in recreation programs. We have events like this. It happens to be at, Wind at Windmill Island Gardens in our pavilion. It takes place in uh, Labor Day. Pictures of some of the plants that we do, some of the beds, all the urns downtown. And we do special projects. American Bloom uh, is one of them that I'm going to talk about. Um, and Tree City USA. We, we just received um, our 36th year um, recognition um, last week in the, in the mail. So we've gotten that award 36 years in a row. So how, how do you get involved? Um, there's many ways to do. We have lots of volunteer opportunities and planting days throughout the city that we post on our website and we have flyers. Uh, participate in Holland and Bloom, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, and apply for a summer job. We not only hire college kids, but we actually hire a lot of retirees, and uh, we've found that they've really enjoyed um, coming in for four to six hours a day, a few days a week, and uh, it's worked out well for them and worked out well for us. And come on, play. We've got lots of lots of things to do. So I'm going to try to show a video here quick um, to get started on um, my American blue. Maybe. the sound it may start right away hopefully the sound will kick on too it's about a three minute long video of, of my next topic <coughs>
could hear it. Yeah. But it was a close enough to hear. There we go. Colored in Bloom, celebrating the pride planted in our community. Living in a community is more than simply having a job and a home. Here in Holland, we believe that investing in the natural environment enhances our quality of life. Holland is known for its tulip festival. City employees, with help from residents, plant over 400,000 balls each year. After the festival, the tulips are replaced with annuals. A tulip pole allows residents to purchase bulbs for replanting in their own yards, and donated annuals are free for residents who live along the tulip lanes. Holland and Bloom helps encourage my neighbors to keep our homes and tulip lanes blooming all season long. One of the benefits of our participation in the American Bloom competition is the receipt of a comprehensive report. These suggestions are shared throughout the community to foster new ideas. A good example of suggestions they gave us is the hanging baskets in the background. And that came from the 2012 suggestion, and we implemented that last year in 2013. American Bloom is more than a competition. It's an opportunity for us to create and sustain vibrant public and private places. Community involvement in the Blizzards to Bloom's Garden Contest allowed us to celebrate the end of a harsh winter and the talents of local gardeners. Green Barrel Workshops show residents how to capture water for reuse in their yards. I love America in the world, and I love it because it showcases our city. It showcases what the residents do, it showcases what the uh, businesses do, and it's another tool that we use to bring national attention to the city of Holland. Businesses of all sizes flourish in West Michigan. This is due not only to the excellent business climate, but the ability of employers to attract a quality workforce drawn to an environmentally rich area. Our local business community is a showcase, and when one business has a beautiful landscaping, it's certainly contagious, and we see up and down our local streets, beautiful office environments, gorgeous industrial parks, a community that's proud of its facilities. Holland has a rich Dutch heritage that is celebrated at Windmill Island Gardens. Our 250-year-old Dutch windmill was recently renovated following an extensive fundraising campaign. Our vibrant and historic downtown is a delight in all seasons. Visitors to Holland pick up on the, the pride of, of our community because of the beautification, the cleanliness, the tidiness, and the general friendliness of the people that live here. Our own Holland and Bloom effort and our partnership with American Bloom has enabled us to work together to celebrate the past and plan for the future of our community. So that is that brings me to my next part of my uh, presentation here for the next few minutes. Um, Holland and Bloom, American Bloom, what is it? Um, it is a uh, great uh, competition that was started uh, almost 12 years ago now. And um, I got bugged by Steve Zweep um, in the presentation um, for about six or seven years in a row. And finally, he's, he's like, we have to do this. This is awesome. You have to, we have to showcase our city this way. And um, so I finally, I gave in, I gave in to the dark side and said, okay, let's do this. And we, we got um, city council's approval to do it. And uh, we haven't looked back. Um, we've been five times, five time winners in our population category, and um, have had much success with that um, association. Um, one thing that Steve and I and our whole committee um, really love about it is it's not just a competition. Um, they they pose it as a competition between communities, but what it really does is it's an effort that brings communities together. Um, we have got a massive amount of collaboration. One minute left, all right. Massive amount of collaboration between private and public entities, Herman Miller, Hayworth, the CBB, um, lots of local individuals um, that uh, participate in it to help us showcase our city. Um, they have um, six different things that this, our city gets judged on every year, so they bring in a couple of people, um, and this year happened to be in September, um, that uh, judge us on things like our heritage, our environmental work that we've done, urban forestry, landscaped areas, floral display, and overall impression. Um, Gwen happens to be a new member of our committee. We have a, a committee made up of a bunch of different um, people from, from areas in business and throughout the city um, that do it. Nathan Box was a narrator of the video, um, and he mentioned in the video what we get out of it is, is, is a lot more than just uh, this 
this fancy award that's, that's pretty cool to look at, but um, you get a, a really big uh, comprehensive report that you would probably pay tens of thousands of dollars to have a um, group come in and give you that kind of feedback on what we could do to improve our community. And uh, so that is, that is very, very nice and very good to have. Um, mentioned these things. Um, one last thing I'll mention is this past fall, summer, late summer, we hosted the National Symposium. We've done so well in the competition, people were so enthralled with our city um, that they decided to host their National Symposium in, in our town last year. We had about 250 people from all over the United States that came, um, all the way from California and the East Coast and uh, from Florida that came to stay here for a few days, participate in the program, and see our city. Uh, gave us an opportunity to showcase what we do um, every day, um, what we do all the time. Uh, it, was a, it was a great, great time. So uh, I have a, uh, I'll put these on a table, but this is some more information if you'd like to check us out. We have a whole slew of those videos um, that the City Holland um, TV and Tech Guys do, they put together for us, um, and they are great to look at. So you can check those out at cityholland.com on our YouTube channel, as well as hollandandbloom.org. That is it. So I will open it up to questions. Anybody has any? Right here. Um, what were you using the color? Color oh, plants and window on the waterfront does a great job. Thank what you. kind of trees did you plant? Uh, we planted a whole lot of different kind of trees. Um, we, one thing that we found out from the Emerald Dash Borer problem is that we have to have a more diverse urban forest. So we've got about 15 different varieties that we planted. Uh, different kinds of ornamentals, different kinds of shade trees, and it, it runs the gamut. So everything that you can think of, maples, oak trees, pear trees, red buds, a whole lot of different kinds. I think I saw uh, trails listed on one of your slides. Does the park department uh, maintain the bicycle trails in the city? Um, we, not necessarily the bicycle trails, the sidewalks. Um, we do trails like at uh, Van Ralty Farm, or those kind of trails. However, I will say, um, you see those little yellow machines riding around town right now, the sidewalk machines. Um, our staff mans those machines. Um, the street department uh, manages the program, but we staff those. Andy, can you yeah. give us about a 30 second update on the Mactaw Water Trail Project, which is a city council approved study that's taking place and also has a cooperation with jurisdictions of Ottawa County. Yeah, I have a park township and Holland City. I will do that. Um, Don Swearinga um, is on mic. Um, he helped uh, drive an effort that uh, really exploded into a big thing. Uh, we are working with Ottawa County, uh, Park Township, um, to create kind of a blue way throughout the Makatawa area. We call it a blue way like a green way, but it's taking place along the water. So we're we're looking to connect areas along the water, all the way from way out in the Makatau Marsh, all the way down through the Makatau Greenway, so you can take basically a kayak and get from point A to point B, and then all the way out to the Big Lake. Um, we're working on some, and Don's been helping a lot with this, and gets a lot of credit um, for pushing this effort, but we are looking at getting some uh, like very nice, um, accessible kayak launch spaces as well as some undeveloped potential kayak launch spaces along some of the road ends throughout the city. Uh, it's an effort ongoing. And we're looking at some granting right now to uh, help us afford that. I live in the Maplewood area. Okay. I live in the Maplewood area, and there are a lot of old trees that look like a V. Yep. The whole center is gone because yep. the lines are in the way. Correct. And I often <laughs> drive under some of those and just wonder about the integrity of those giant branches that are hanging over the road. Sure. Is there any long-term plan to replace those kinds of really tall trees with more ornamentals or something yes. that won't be such a long-term problem? There is. So due to urban sprawl, that's what you're seeing. So over the course of time, those, year, those trees are probably 80 to 90 year old trees or more. So with the advent of overhead power lines, um, that's why those V's are there um, due to line clearance problems. And it's a problem we have all over the city. So we keep our eye on those particular ones very closely. And um, we do have a, a succession plan for those, those, those places. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a problem. It's just something people didn't think about many, many years ago. And so when we plant new trees, we take that into account. So when I talk about ornamental trees, those are areas by power lines that we put those trees. Thank you. 
keep running. They're ugly, and we don't like it. And, and we don't like it either. So our, our tree crew takes takes that uh, offensively. Yes. I have no power lines in front of my house, and my ashes had to be taken down. Yes. Can there be large shade trees put where there are no lines? Absolutely. Uh, well, I miss those shade trees. Yeah. What we've done is every ash tree that we took down in the last few years, we we collected um, addresses. So we have addresses of every place we took ash trees down, whether it was one, two, three, or four, or five. And um, they're in a spreadsheet now, and we're working our way through that spreadsheet. So the first 600 trees in the next year, those first 600 we took down are going to get, that's where we're earmarking those trees to go. So we're going to keep going down that list, and it's going to be a multi-year list. And, um, I'm talking, so can I get a tall one? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, <laughs> um, the unfortunate thing is ball and burlap trees that are great. Eventually tall. Yeah. So, yes, absolutely. So if the area calls for a big shade tree, we will put a big shade tree there. Great. Yep, absolutely. And if I don't do it, call me back. <laughs> when one notices uh, large dead limbs in trees that are between the curb and the sidewalk, which you explained this city, your department. Yep. Does one call your department or Steve Sweep for attention to those? Steve Sweep is at my department. Um, Steve Sweep just does parks, so I have a forestry supervisor named Mike. Um, the request would go to him and his crew, but if you called our office, on, um, it's on the green sheet and it was on the slide um, earlier, um, that phone number is on the website and also on city calendars and, and everywhere in the phone book. You can call my office and that's where we'll, we'll take that information. I know you plant some bulbs by hand, some by machine. We do. Um, is there an advantage or disadvantage to doing it either way, and why don't you do more planting by machine? Yeah, so I actually have a little video, and if anybody wants to stick around at the end, I don't, because I was going to run, I knew I was going to run out of time, but I have about another two minute video of us planting with um, our tractor. So the areas we plant with tractors versus hand are those at Windmill Island Gardens and Window on the Waterfront. So the great big fields is where we plant with. Um, a bulb planter machine. It's a, it's a garlic bulb machine that's been modified. We pull it behind a tractor, it has little discs that spin and we drop bulbs in and it goes down into a chute that through a little, makes a little hole in the ground. Um, all along the roadway, all along all of our parks, we do those all by hand. Um, so the machine digs the trench along the right of way in the, along the curb strips and then we go back through and plant those actually all by hand. Um, we haven't found a machine yet that would do that the way we want it to do it, so we still do it by hand. So, yeah. You said something about a grow house or a show house. What would that be like? A for show house. So when, you, when you sell your greenhouse. Yeah, so a show house is really expensive, and so um, in a, if I got pie in the sky and I can get whatever I want, we would build a small version of Frederick Meyer Gardens um, that would be glass. And, but a grow house is just basically, that's just what it is. We, it's a production facility that we that we grow our plants. That's the difference. Yes? Yeah, um, now ash trees are off the list of, of trees that you would replant. Correct. Are there other tree species that uh, are on your, we will not plant these because they are susceptible to disease encroachment? Um, some, there's, there's some new, elm got mentioned up front, there's actually some new species of, of elm that are um, good to plant again, um, and the U.S. Forest Service is pushing that. Um, sycamore trees, there's a lot of sycamore in town, and sycamore is a great tree, but it's not planted in the right spot where they are now. Um, they like swampy areas, so if we're gonna plant sycamore, we do it in a multi farm or somewhere not in the right of way. Um, so there's, there's, there's a few, but there's not too many that we won't plant. Um, like I said, real real diverse urban forest is really, really good for everybody involved. So. Last question? One more? All right. I heard about the resale of the bulbs at the end of uh, tulip time. Correct. How does that work and who does it? Yeah, so that is actually a fundraiser for our Holland and Bloom group. Um, we, uh, what we do is at Window on the Waterfront and at Centennial Park, a couple of years ago we had this great idea, hey, we, we could get people to take the bulbs out of the ground because we need to grind them up and remove them anyway. 
and we could fundraise for it. So one of our biggest fundraisers for that effort um, is this tulip poll. So at the end of May, um, we ask people if they want to come. Um, it's usually a Saturday. Um, bring a five-gallon bucket, and you can fit as many tulip bulbs as you can in that five-gallon bucket for ten dollars. And uh, in Centennial Park and at Window on the Waterfront, because all of our parks get new tulips every year, um, just so they look nice. And so uh, they have to come out of the grounds one way or the other, and it helps with many hands to get that work done. So it benefits us all the way around. So that comes out sometime in late May. Well, Andy, thank you so thank much. You. That was a wonderful time. Our next speaker is Bo Miller. My husband's promised to make me cornbread out of this as a Christmas present, and an award-winning author. Um, Alisa won the 2015 State History Award from the Historical Society of Michigan for her book, The Swan. Alisa has been featured in the media in the U.S. and in the Netherlands. Here's one example where she's been featured. Alisa has been working in the history field since the age of 15, and she's been working in mills since the age of 17. She has a BA in history from Kalamazoo College and a master's degree from the Cooperstown Graduate Program in History Museum Studies. Raised in Michigan, Alisa has worked in, in, or interned or studied in other states, including Massachusetts, New York, Kentucky, Virginia, and Hawaii. She joined the staff of Windmill Island in 2002. In 2006, she began Miller's training in the Netherlands, and in September 2007, became the first overseas student to become a Dutch certified Miller. In 2009, Elisa qualified for professional Miller's training, and in 2010, she was admitted into the Professional Grain Miller's Guild, the only woman among 35 Dutch men. She continues to blaze a trail that is all her own, reaching new heights along the way, and she's proving that she's far from a run of the will, Bill Wolf. <laughs> Alisa's mom, Julia Collingsworth, is here today, and also has member and former president, Phil Van Eyland, who taught Alisa Dutch. And I know they worked on esoteric. Bill, billing terms and everything that um, Elisa needed to pass the oral part of the test, written and technical. So, thank you, Phil. And thank you, Elisa. And all I can say is, Holland must really be a special place. Because I moved here from Hawaii and I stayed. So, there's a couple other people out there I would also like to recognize. Um, my mother's husband, Rock Collingsworth, is also here in the back with her. Um, Phil Van Isle is in the back, and I'm going to say Goeiemorgen, and um, this is my Nederlands Laura, and a hearty dank. So that was a hearty thanks to him for all the work that he did with me. A couple other people I think I need to recognize, and I think I'm going to make them stand up. So I want to recognize Dick Stafford over there on the side. Dick, go ahead and stand up. Uh, Dick has been a long time volunteer at the Windmill, and he has done some wonderful projects, and I uh, couldn't do without him. And Linda Walsh, I'm going to make stand up. Linda, stand up. She's one of our illustrious tour guides at the Windmill, and she is one of the wonderful people that explain the workings of the Windmill to our thousands and thousands of visitors that come through every year. So they aren't the only two that need to stand up. I'm actually going to make all of you stand up now. Okay, it's time for the windmill workout. Everybody up. Here we go. All right, arms up in the air, a little stretch. There you go. Just like the windmill. Excellent. There we go. I think that we all needed that after sitting for a little bit. That's perfect. The reason why I also made you stand up was because I want to thank all of you for all of the support 
and the wonderful dedication you've also had to the window. Because one of the things that we did recently that you might be aware of was a restoration, a major restoration of the windmill that took place in 2013. Well, the way I figured it, the windmill had been there for almost 50 years, right? Probably after 50 years, anybody needs a major restoration, right? Yes. So we did some remarkable things with that project, and we couldn't have done it without the help of all of you. It was amazing for Andy and I to watch the cap of the windmill be removed. Dick was there to watch it too. We, we couldn't believe it, but that's what had to be done. We were able to do some really significant improvements, like an overhaul on the brake, which is important to make sure the windmill can stop from turning. We were able to reclad the outside body of the mill with some beautiful new cedar shingles, which had already been there for nearly 50 years. And then in Andy's video, he showed, I was glad it was included in the Helen and Bloom video, because it also included the beautiful new copper shingles that adorned the top of the cap. And they just shone like a brand new penny when they were put on. It was glorious. Dick and I had to almost, you know, block the shine because it was so bright. Now they're turning a beautiful brown, and eventually they'll take on that patina of the green that we remember from the old shingles. Um, some additional things that got done that I really appreciate, we were able to make some little changes as far as the way the millstones turn and operate and grind. And I have to tell you, with all of these changes, including a whole new set of rollers to allow the cap and the blades to turn any direction into the wind, that windmill works better now than probably it did in 50 years. So it's really in great shape. And it's, it's again, thanks to many of you for making that possible. So after we got through that restoration, then we're able to move forward and allow the windmill to work again. And some of the things that we've been doing since that time, um, reflecting back on this past tulip time, is Gwen kind of recap for us. At Windmill Island Gardens, we hosted 40,000 visitors in that one week of tulip time. And uh, Linda and I can tell you, <laughs> it was exciting and exhausting, but it was invigorating to see that many people come and visit. Um, we had 10,000 of those 40,000 in one day alone. That was the first Saturday. And then another 8,000 the next day. So we did 18,000 visitors from all over the world in one weekend alone. So it was really remarkable to be able to have them there and, and show them our wonderful windmill. So I've got up on the screen here a little diagram that I think is very helpful just to kind of understand you know, how does this windmill work? And we're actually going to be using this new diagram that is found in the new book, which you'll get a couple of shameless commercials here, but um, that diagram is in this book. It was, it was created actually just for the book. But it really explains well the seven stories of that mill and the fact that each floor has a function. And it, it allows you to be able to kind of understand, well, how do windmills work? Because one of the most important parts of the story that we try to convey to our visitors that somehow eludes them when they just look at the windmill from afar, they don't understand that the windmill works. Wow, that seems basic, right? But that's a story we need to tell. Linda and I work on that all the time, don't we? So I, I want to show a couple little videos just to reinforce that. And again, thanks to this restoration, it works wonderfully. So let's let's call up a little video here. All right. Oh, let's go on the other way. <laughs> what if we can turn it? Yeah, I don't know if we can either. All right, turn your heads. Just kidding. All right. Yeah. Um, some of you might have been there when we celebrated in 2014, um, kind of a, a dedication of that restoration. And we were able to have what we call the turning of the blades, which really was a great moment. So I've got a little more that I want to show from the inside. Here we go. So 
So this is up on the fifth floor, the stone floor, when we're doing the grinding. You see the blades turning outside the window? The wooden gears turning? Great, and then we're gonna get a little closer view of um, green showing that I'm not sure if it's going to call up or not. No, I don't think it is. That's okay. I'll try again later. All right, let's have the lights back up. So I want to talk for a little bit about that grinding and about the mill working because, again, that's part of the story that we're telling our thousands of visitors that are coming to the mill. That's part of what makes our mill special it works and, and that is amazing so what are we producing there well when the mill was opened in 1965 they were able with the help of the dutch millwright and miller deep made york to start grinding and producing a flour that they packaged much like in maybe a bag like this and they were able to sell it to the tourists as a little souvenir which is nice we're still doing that today but we're doing lots more, and that's what I want to make sure you have the chance to know. We are still grinding a wonderful locally grown wheat that's a soft white winter wheat. It's grown by West Michigan farmers. It gets turned into a beautiful whole wheat flour that's sold not only to all the visitors that come to Windmill Island Gardens, but we're actually really in the business because um, part of my membership in that guild that Alice mentioned, which uh, for Phil's benefit, the Abakla Korba was held up, yeah. <laughs> so the Professional and Traditional Grain Millers Guild of the Netherlands. The uh, 44 Dutch men that are in it, um, you know, they are, like me, they're producing and selling to local bakeries and restaurants and other places. What they grind and sell is how they earn their living or earn their daily bread, as the Dutch would say. So what are we doing? We're doing something very similar, because I have to hold my own in that guild. Dallas mentioned I'm the only woman, and I'm the only one outside the Netherlands, so I really have to hold my own. But we are selling to places like DeBoer Bakery. We're selling to Beechwood Inn. So the next time you go there and sit down and have dinner, ask for the Dutch roasted chicken because it's coated with flour from the windmill, which is wonderful. Uh, DeMore Bakery uses it in a variety of different ways, which is nice, either in breads or some cookies or muffins. And then new this last year, which was kind of exciting for Lynn and I to talk about in the mill, was a, a partnership that we developed with Coppercraft Distillery. And initially, when you think grinding grain into flour, making bread, right? Oh no, there's a lot more you can do with grains. Yeah. Breweries and distilleries, especially in the Netherlands, all relied on the work of windmills to grind that grain for their business too. So together we produced a Dutch gin called Geneva. And it was a pretty exciting partnership. Um, that Dutch gin or Geneva wound up in a cocktail that was served in about 12 to 14 different restaurants in Holland at tulip time. So think of that connection, all those people being exposed to that and figuring out, oh, you mean the grain for this gin was actually ground in your working windmill? Mm -hmm. Yes, it really was. So that was last year's project, and I like to take on new projects. You probably noticed that. So the next new project is um, developing a partnership with New Holland Brewery. Well, as we know, business is business, but face it, business is built on relationships. And it takes time to maybe build some of those relationships. So my next effort has been to build a relationship with New Holland Brewery. And um, fortunately, they're very open to experimenting with something different. And both their chef and their brewer are really excited to do something wild and crazy, or at least new and different this year. And that is using rye. That's different from the wheat that we've been grinding. So I have 
built a relationship with a farmer, and so he's growing rye locally, organically, non-GMO, and that rye is then being ground at the windmill with separate stones so it doesn't uh, interact with the big stones that are grinding the wheat. And that is being turned into both cracked rye for mash, for a beer, and then also a rye flour that will grow, go into a rye bread that they're gonna be able to serve there at New Holland Brewery. So that's something that's very exciting. So I already mentioned a different grain, didn't I? Yeah, Alice already mentioned another one, which is corn. So that, that farmer that I, that I mentioned, he's not only growing the rye, but he's growing corn. So I'm working with the same family to supply two different grains. And now we've already expanded from wheat to corn to rye, which is great. So yeah, we are in the business for sure. So with that corn, I was able to produce a corn meal and then also corn grits. How many people ever eat grits? I'm curious. Yeah, some of you. You know what? Yes, I was raised in the north, but I've, I've converted. I like grits. I eat grits. And you know what? They're great. So we have visitors from all over the country, and even southern Indiana, they eat grits down there. They are so excited to find that we sell grits. So it's nice to be able to supply different demands like that from our, from our tourists that are visiting us. So we're not only doing that, but we're also shipping flour out. Because quite often what happens, people come visit us, they love it, and they want more. So all they have to do is email and uh, find me, and, and I'll say, yep, send me a check, and I'll ship it right out. So we're doing a lot of that too. And you never know where the flour winds up. We were lucky enough to find out, Linda, I think it was via Facebook, wasn't it? Um, we found out that a woman used our flower and won a blue ribbon at the Kentucky State Fair. <laughs> and she didn't tell us, her friend told us, you know, so her friend tattled. But I was really glad to know that. Because, like I said, you never know where the flower winds up, you never know who uses it, and how happy they are with it. But that's the beauty of having this as a working windmill. It's blessing our community in ways that we can't even imagine, but those are some real tangible reminders of how it's working and it's still relevant today as a, as a historical structure. So as far as our grinding seasons, people sometimes ask them, when are you grinding? I want to come on a day when you're grinding, right? We get that a lot. Um, my answer is often, come when there's wind. <laughs> it's a windmill, you know. Um, anyway. They, they do want to see that, but the season for grinding is often from, uh, say, April through November, but with a mild December that we had this year, guess what? I was still out there working. I could work all the way up until Christmas, which was nice. Now that it's really, really winter, and I'm going to just show you one lovely picture if I can find it here. Um, there we go. Um, I snapped this photo on Monday when I was out um, walking around the, the windmill part of the island, and that's what we look like right now. So um, people kind of think, well, the windmill must go to sleep and you don't do anything during the winter, right? No, guess what? I'm still out there working. And um, the windmill is a wonderful 30 to 32 degrees inside. So we have about 4,400 pounds of flour in the flour bin, the stainless steel flour bin, waiting to be packaged that will be sold at tulip time. And normally we go through a freezing process. Well, guess what? I think it's already frozen just being in the window. So we're going to be working on that next. Um, just to recap, you know, again, 2015 was such a big, important year for us. It was our 50th anniversary. We celebrated with a lot of uh, different special events. Um, it was exciting for me because the, the book was released and then won an award. But the other exciting project that I was happy to finish by the end of 2015 that I'm excited to give a sneak peek to all of you is I finished and mailed off on December 30th the application for the nomination to be on the historic register um, for the windmill. And, uh, which is really a significant deal. If, if we can manage that, and it'll take most of 2016 for that to go through, but we can then have our windmill listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And that recognizes it, 
and protects it and potentially opens other doors, um, which is very, very important. So stay tuned for that one. Um, and lastly, before my time is out, because we've got such great timekeepers, I, I do want to invite you to come out to the windmill. Okay, you don't maybe have to come out right now when it's all snowy. You're welcome to come out and walk. Dick does all the time, which is wonderful. But come, come see the windmill. Come ask what's happening out there. And we have an opportunity coming right up very soon on Saturday, January 23rd, for you to come for a little R&R for refurbishment and refreshments at Windmill Island Gardens. And that's gonna be Saturday from 1 to 2.30. We wanna <coughs> inform you about what work we've been doing on not only the windmill, but also the carousel and the street organ and give you a good update so that you feel that you're informed and um, yes, we'll have coffee and, and cookies, probably windmill cookies, I bet. Um, but see me after and we can get you signed up to be able to come out for that program. It would be wonderful to have you. So we can put the lights back up. And again, please come to our wonderful windmill and thank you again for all the support that you've given over the years. It's genuinely appreciated. So thank you. Now we've got questions. Originally, yes. windmills in Holland were used to empty the land of water and for pumps. How did they work? I mean, now we see grinding wheels. Okay, for, forgive me if I can just correct you, um, but the original purpose for windmills was to grind grain, and so that dates back to the 12th century. Um, when they got to the 16th century and the Dutch were really suffering from not being able to keep up with the water levels. Um, a very brilliant Dutchman came up with the idea that they were able to apply a scoop wheel. Um, in Dutch we say a shuck rod and it would scoop the water up and then elevate it to a higher level. They would put together a series of windmills called Molenhang or a mill gang and each one would raise it maybe part of a meter. And so they would have maybe four or five in a row in order to do this. Through that system, they were able to drain vast areas of land called polders and then they finally had space for agricultural, you know, for a living and that was well timed with when the tulip mania occurred because there was all this money that was being made from the investing but they needed land to buy, so they had to drain the land to be able to provide that. Thank you, I, I, was, I was wrong. <laughs> Good question though. Great, other questions? Yes, not, sir. Not a question, but just a comment. For those who are new to trolley guiding, uh, up until the last couple of years, we used to pull around Freedom Village, get into the parking lot, say, turn over your, turn around to your right, over your right shoulder, and you could see the windmill. And people would then ask, how do I get there? What does it cost? And it was not part of the tour. The change that was made a couple of years ago was kind of a brilliant decision just to include the windmill in the tour. And I would say 99% of my of, of trolley guide people or trolley people get off at the windmill. And certainly if they don't, they can go back later. But that change, people come to Holland to see tulips, and the windmill, and we now include them in the tour, and I was very happy that that improvement was made a couple of years ago. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for that feedback. We found that it's really worked for us, too, because honestly, before, when you were only able to pull around and point it out, it's a little bit like showing a kid candy and saying you can't eat it, right? But now, they have the opportunity, they have access, and to be able to come and visit and really um, enhance their tulip time experience. And that's so important for our visitors. So thank you, I really appreciate that. Question over here. Yes, I've heard that uh, you actually climb the blades and put the fabric on. Could you kind of share what that's like? Sure. Uh, the question or the comment was, um, there's a rumor, well, it's not really a rumor, that I actually climbed the blades and um, set the sails and so forth. It is true. Um, but I do want to provide the disclaimer, I do wear a harness, I do connect to a safety line, and um, as far as height, just to give you an idea, the deck or gallery of the windmill is up about 35 feet already, then the blades are another 40 feet up in the air. 
So in order to harness more power, the sails are, are really helpful. So in order to set the sails, yes, you have to climb up the blades. And every spring, so we actually take them down in the winter. So every fall I climb up, take them down. This isn't the Netherlands. Um, we can't see the picture well, but with all that snow, it doesn't look like that in the Netherlands right now. I emailed this picture of the Netherlands to my colleagues. They said, oh, it's dreary and rainy here. You've got a beautiful picture of snow. So we have a harsher winter here. So I take the sails down so that they'll last longer because you know, with them being a gift from the residents of Freedom Village, I want them to last as long as possible. So, yeah, it's just part of the job, I guess. I, I give a lot of credit to our firefighters too, and they just feel like that's part of their job too. Thank you. Lisa, you are not alone when you climb because we're watching you from the <laughs> <laughs> she, she assures me I'm not alone when I'm climbing up because they're peering out their windows at Freedom Village and go, oh, there she goes again. So, thank you. I appreciate your prayers. Okay. Is there a problem of the grinding keeping up with the marketing, or vice versa, the marketing keeping up with the grinding? So, yeah, the question being, is there a problem with keeping up with perhaps the demand? Um, it, it is challenging, I agree, because in July and August, you find that there's a lot of wind? Not necessarily. So, I like to stay ahead of the curve, because keep in mind, the week of tool time alone, we're selling 2,500 pounds of flour, okay? Over the course of the year, I'm grinding 10 to 12,000 pounds of grain. Um, so to be really prepared for tulip time and beyond, I've already, like I said, I've ground 4,500 pounds that are waiting to be sold. So I try to get ahead of it if I can. Um, it's a good problem to have that your product is really popular. So I guess let's call that job security, right? <laughs> okay. Yes. And Lisa, um, one of the things I found quite remarkable at the operation out there Windmill Island was the reenactments that uh, bring a lot of school kids out there or just at the beginning of two of time. I think you want to comment on that? Sure, the, the comment was about the event that we hold um, during tulip time. And that's one of, one of my projects that I've really enjoyed working on in the last 10 years. It's called the Historic Dutch Trade Fair. And for those of you involved in tulip time or um, being trolley guides, it's good to know about. This is a historic um, reenactment event that we have about 125 reenactors from that represent both the 17th and 18th centuries. And the focus is really on trade because Tulip Time, the festival, really celebrates the influence of the Dutch on our local community. What we've tried to do with that event is look at how the Dutch influenced and impacted colonial America. And a lot of that was really done through the trade because they became, became masters of the global trading market. So in order to use that event as an opportunity to educate our local school children, we put through about 11 to 1,200 school children on the Friday, the day before tulip time begins, and then Monday morning um, after that first weekend. So uh, my tulip time really begins before tulip time, but it's such a wonderful, rewarding experience to see these third, fourth, and fifth graders come through excited to learn about history in the shadow of our wonderful windmill. And it makes all of that come alive to them, you know, even more than what a history book can. So that's a great program to know about. We have selected merchants that stay the rest of Tulip Time week. So that's probably good for you to know about during Tulip Time. Okay. Great. Other questions? Yeah. A couple of things. First is, um, the What's My Life in the 1960s was on Game Show Network in the middle of the night. I used to see You it. saw it! And uh, Dutch <laughs> Miller from Holland. Deep Baden Dark. Yeah, and I thought that would be a really cool video clip to be able to have available at Windmill Island. I, I actually have it because yeah. we tracked it down um, because I put it in the book. Okay. And what she's talking about was Deep Baden Dark, the Dutch millwright who worked on reconstructing our windmill. Um, the wonderful, illustrious Bill Wickers arranged for him to be on the show, What's My Line? Does anybody remember What's My Line? That show, a lot of you do. So imagine this Dutchman flying to New York, being on TV, and they were supposed to guess what his occupation was. It's a wonderful show. So yeah, the clip is, is fabulous. So maybe that's something we could do. So that's a great comment. 
And my other question, and either you, maybe I should have asked this to Andy, but I just thought of it now, is many tourists on the trolleys asked me what that platform was out in the middle of the marsh, and I said, well, I thought it was for bird nesting. Anybody the, know? Are you talking about okay the one that's way out in the middle? Yeah, it's raised the, on a pole. You know, it's a, yeah, it's an awesome. osprey nest. So our, our local Audubon Society fundraised to have a, a osprey. There's going to be two of them. But they're trying to get the ospreys to come off of the buoys out of Lake Mac and try to nest in the marsh. So they need a spot that they can see I don't know, a thousand feet around yeah. with no obstructions. So they built that. We have a lot of wonderful wildlife out at Windmill Gardens, and many of you probably noticed. We've got kind of a resident red-tailed hawk that has decided that the windmill blades have now become his perch. And so um, it's always been fun for me to start up the windmill and see how long it takes them with the blades coming out before he decides he's going to fly off. We, we almost have a little game of chicken there, but yeah. But yeah, pay attention. We've got such wonderful wildlife. It's amusing for us every day to see, you know, what animals kind of... So, um, I'm gonna. Well, there might be one more question, but I'm gonna pass around a basket. And um, all of you have been such a wonderful audience. You know, you've asked great questions that you get a souvenir to take home today. So this is a little bit like the opposite of church. Instead of putting something in the basket, you get to take something out. So we're gonna pass that around. Thank you so much. Lisa.